we, we, we build upon the things <laughs> that we mean to do for, because we're, um, what's the word? Articulate? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's us. <laughs> um. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Doc discuss the concept of snacking and binging in short and long form games. Plus, Jim curates the perfect games for Singles Awareness Day, and Doc talks bad facts. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hey everybody, Doc here, and welcome to episode 57 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. I'm here with Jim. Hey, Doc. Hey. And today we're going to talk about snacking and binging. And we're not talking about expanding your waistline, we're Uh talking about game length. Yeah. So, um, stick around. Uh, We're going to get started, I believe, first with uh, Button Mosh. Get ready for the Button Mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. You know, I've been kind of in a uh, post-apocalyptic kick, and so I decided to give uh, a different post-apocalyptic game a try. That would be Mad Max, based on the recent Fury Road uh, movie that came out. Uh, as it, Is it really based on Fury Road? Well, yeah, it's based on, on the more recent... Um, Call it world reboot, kind of. I don't. I don't know if I want to call it that. There's. There's. It's fan- definitely not a reboot, but it's. It, see, it's interesting with with because I'm, I'm a fan of the Mad Max universe yeah. and the films and all that. And it's like each film, it's almost like they're going. Max is going farther and farther into the wasteland, so things are getting more and more, um, destroyed and desolate, and like well, there's time less is society. passing too. So. And of course, time is passing too. But it, you just, I mean, that's part of it too. You just kind of feel. Like, there's a lot to the world as the farther he goes, kind of, like, I'm assuming it's west, because he starts out kind of on the east coast, right? Of Australia? Well, but it doesn't feel like it's in any particular location. But it totally is. They're, they're all speaking Australian. Yeah, but that was because it was made in Australia. You think that's the reason? Well, there's spec on this one, actually, on the on the yeah. game. Let's talk about the game. Yeah, that's uh, That, in fact, what he's done is crossed the Pacific Ocean and has made it to America. Um, there's even hints that the Golden Gate Bridge is there. And so that would make it just literally right off the coast of San mm. Francisco. That actually How, goes, fits very well with my theory. Of it going uh-huh. <laughs> uh, however, <laughs> oh, in that case, he'd be going east, not west. But, um, you know, it, it, what's interesting about it is, you know, you've still got um, some people who are speaking in the Australian accent, but you've also got some who have kind of an American accent. And um, the ocean is completely dried up. He drove there, by the way. Uh, so whenever you start the game, the whole big area that you're starting in is the dried up ocean. And it's kind of fun because you've got big coral reefs and all kinds of things and, and big, deep gadget, uh, g- is that a word? I don't know. Jagged gorges. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and, and all these other things that you feel like it's that way. There's crashed ships or rather sunken ships, um, crashed planes. And, uh, man, I have a lot to say about this game cause I'm really enjoying it, but I, I want to put a disclaimer on there first very samey and there's a sort of vocabulary that goes along with it um you know you punch bozos you get you better at that you you improve max the same way that you improve the car by the way the plot is not very complicated uh one of the war bosses it's very different from the mad max films oh, oh, oh pff, pff, right I'm kidding. um <laughs> one of the war bosses scrotus uh you, you put a chainsaw through his head in the opening mm-hmm. moments and um they steal your car and you spend the game trying to get your car back that's it. I mean, that's that's literally. What I was actually going to ask if you were using the interceptor. Like well, his... you're not. You're trying to retrieve the interceptor for the rest of the game. Yeah, which is actually really pretty cool because you very quickly run into a hunchback. And if big fans of, of Mad Max will mm-hmm. recognize uh, Chum Bucket mm-hmm. from the comics, um, but that's who it is. It's, it's Chum Bucket. It, it, I'm Chum Bucket, and I'm here. I'm going to fix your car, <laughs> Saint. Because that's what he calls him. He calls him Saint the whole time. Mm-hmm. Along with the movie, he's not referred to as Max. Um, and so what you've got is a different car that you're upgrading 
so that you can go take on Gastown, so that you can get a V8, so that you can continue to upgrade the car, so that you can then take on Scrotus, so that you can get your car back. Hmm. And in this process, you meet these other, I don't want to call them warlords because they're supposed to be the good guys. They're kind of like little, um, you know, heads of areas, hmm. if you will. And uh, the first guy's name is Jeet. And so Jeet, he's got like this uh, this problem with picking at his own skin, and he, he's got this uh, nervous habit of, of putting arrowheads through his face, things like that. Um, so nobody's healthy. Nobody's normal. It's the Mad Max universe. Everybody's got post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's very, very obvious. But by helping him out, you actually watch his little mini kingdom, city-state, if you will, improve and take power away from Scrotus's um, really terrible um, minions. Mm. So what's interesting to me on a, a kind of a philosophical level, if you will, playing this game, you almost feel like a bad guy because you come into this place that has this established um, rule of law, if you will. And if you look at it from a completely outside standpoint, completely objectivist standpoint, basically you are overthrowing the government and um, killing everyone. Mm-hmm. But you can't look at it that way. <laughs> well, you have to look at it as moral objectivity, right and wrong. You're coming in, you're re- reestablishing order, and the good people are taking back over. Yeah, and also, I mean, Mad Ma- Max himself is, has this... He's really more of an anti-hero anyway, and he kind of has his... That's true. He he has his own sort of, like, sense of justice, and he kind of just follows his own code. Yeah, he does. But I don't think you can stick him into a, a box and, and classify him like the, you know classic knights with daring do no that. he's clearly more not. of a yeah he's more of a this anti-hero type character it kind of reminds me of and I'm, i wonder if it was an inspiration in the initial for the first well maybe not maybe less with the first mad max film but all mm-hmm. the ones after it um conan and the yeah, stories of yeah. like this sort of wandering uh roguish character that has his own sense of morality and justice that he lives by mm-hmm. but sometimes and, and sometimes quite often that strongly conflicts with the civilizations that he goes to. It's true. I'm more of a Gru fan personally, but uh, that's a different <laughs> story. Uh, well, what's interesting is that's actually dealt with in the game. Um, one of the ways that you upgrade, and there's three or four different ways of upgrading. I'll talk about the mechanics real quick. But um, when, when you upgrade, this guy actually talks to you, and, he, and he's like the this oracle. And he's like, where's the real you? What, where's the man who had a wife? Where's the man who had children? Um, you're, you're running from yourself and you will never be able to escape. And, and that sort of thing. It's the only time you ever deal with that. And it's mm-hmm. almost like it slaps you back in the face with, do you realize what you're doing? Do, mm-hmm. do you realize that you're going through the wasteland and that you have killed literally hundreds of people? Are you, are you, is this, is this occurring to you? And, and it's right there. It's in the game. It's well, fantastic. There's, I mean, that's kind of part of the Mad Max, Mad Max's journey from since the very first film. Yes. It's like he's, he's, been unhinged since that first film where he, mm-hmm. you know, loses his wife and kid. So he's always kind of been running from that. That's right. And just keeps traveling, keeps moving, never wants to, like, settle in any place. Yep. That's exactly right. Okay, so some details about the game. Um, bullets are extremely scarce, and this is a very, very good thing. You're, you're literally the only person who has a gun, except for some of the snipers. And um, so that makes you like really powerful that you can go in with your shotgun and just blow the bozos away if you have the ammo. And that's actually a whole quest chain just to get a guy who knows how to make ammo unless you can scrounge it and find it. Um, you can upgrade your car with scrap. You can upgrade yourself with scrap. You can do all these other things, but it's a slow process. So there's two ways to play this game. You can main quest it and get there pretty quick, especially if you're really uh, good. And I'm talking player ability here. Mm-hmm. It is possible through player ability, to basically just mainline the quest, go on in, and do it. Um, because all the main quests are things like, oh, you need to upgrade this aspect here of your car so that you can go pull the hinges off the jaw, and then you can make it up to the area that's not the ocean anymore. Or you can do what I do, which is what I do in all the games like Assassin's Creed that have uh, explorable things and uh, lootable stuff, and that's I clear an area completely out before I go to the next one. I will ignore mainline quests for... Just well, it feels like game years <laughs> in order to to clean stuff out, become really rich, really powerful, really um, beef up my character, and then move on and just kind of cakewalk through the rest. And it sounds like to me, with in, in this game, there's context for that within the game, both in the sense that Correct. Max might do that, mm-hmm. um, and also there's not that sense of urgency where some games that have that, it's like, well, you need to go here and stop this person from 
taken over the world. Yeah. And you just kind of decide, no, I'm going to go do like 50 side quests and spend, you know, That's days right. and days and That's days. That's exactly Doesn't right. make any sense. Why are they waiting on you to come there and stop no. them? But this one, it's more like, well, he's just, he's got to go back and get his car back. So mm-hmm. he, it's still going to be there. They're still going to be using it. Well, and the cinematic experience would be very, very different than the player experience. Of because course. I have agency and I'm looking at it and going, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and take down this camp because I'm here. Um, I, I'm going to spend the 15, 20 minutes to do that. Uh, which brings me to a really interesting point. Every area, every space feels extremely natural, organic, rational, reasonable, and um, as an explorer game type, I am loving it. Because you walk in and you go, um, where, do, where do these guys, these ra- I'll call them raiders, I'll appropriate a, a, a fallout term here. Uh, where do these raiders go to the bathroom? Hmm. Well, you know, guess what? They have a toilet set up. It hangs out over the side of the ridge, and it really serves no in-game purpose, but it's there. Uh, how do they get their water? Well, you know what? They're, they actually have a place for that. Um, where's their food? Oh, look, there it is. And and yet every single one of them is completely different. The layout is different. Some of them are linear. Some of them are non-linear. Some of them are in a crashed plane. Some neat. of them are in, in a crashed boat. So they've really kind of thought out it's how beautiful. this world is supposed to, supposed to work, yes. essentially. The world works hmm. and it is the mad max world and it works it doesn't feel like a slap together thing it feels like any anything that you choose to do whatever obsessive level you choose to engage it at whatever you choose it's going to feel right uh, but anyway yeah that's that's mad max there's there's more i am uh game wise probably a third of the way through the game but i've spent i've spent a good 40 hours in it already because i'm taking my time and, and doing it and i i enjoy games at that granular level so that's pretty. That's pretty neat. That's a game I do kind of want to play. Yeah. Um. When I get a chance, I'll talk some more. There's there's some games coming out very soon that I've been looking forward to, and I'm trying. I'm gonna try to really think carefully about which ones I get into, and no that's kidding. gonna tie into what, our later topic. I'll, I'll trade you. I'll trade you The Witcher, and we can we can switch out. Yeah. It's time for war stories, tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. This all builds off of the games that we've been talking about and in our final topic, our meaty topic. Yeah, we're quite organized. We, we, we build upon things <laughs> that we mean to do for because we're, um, what's the word? Articulate? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's us. Um, <laughs> but yeah, part of what we were talking about and, and getting into Witcher 3 and, the, and what sort of inspired me to uh, essentially go back to the main quest line was I had been playing this game for about two months and I really hadn't had that much time to play and sometimes when I come home from work, I don't even want to play games because I'm just so, you know, burnt yeah. out or something. Or I have other things that I'm doing or I can only play for a few hours. So I think I checked my time before I left and I was at about maybe 75 or 80. I forget exactly. I haven't checked super recently. Sure, yeah. But I was around 75, 80 hours, which I could have put so much more time in. And I realized back uh, this last weekend, I better finish this game because I'm never going to finish it. There's too many side quests. There's too much to do. And I get I got something that I, I've been calling open world fatigue where a game just has Ooh. so much content and it's so huge and it's and it's not there's nothing wrong with the content it's actually one of the better open world especially for an open world fantasy game i mean it's it's one of the very best um, that i've ever played so you look at something like this it's not the content itself it's the problem it's i don't have the time anymore yeah to sit here and and play through all these side quests in a in a time frame that makes sense and to play the same game for like two months two months straight and that's one of the only games you can play because if you want to beat it, you kind of have to because I don't have time to sit there and play yeah. 10 hours a day yeah. anymore. I can't play like like six, seven, eight hours a day like maybe I could have when I was younger mm-hmm. to get through it in a reasonable time. So I'm, I just want to be done with it. I want to beat the game. I want to know what happens in the story. And in order to do that, I have to just so you're get not, all the side So you're not playing until 3 a.m.? No. You're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's kind of been my issue that, that I'm worried about is just I'm, it's, this is informing what games I want to get in the future because there's a few releases that I've looked at like Far Cry Primal that's coming out yeah. soon, open world, or or the new Fire Emblem, which is a big you know R- It's an R- It is an RPG strategy RPG, right? But it's so it's a very long, lots of content, and this is starting to make me think. Well, even though it's not that I don't want to play those games, but maybe I don't want to play those games right away. Maybe I want mm-hmm. to take a little break, um, go back and and finish off Mar- you know Super Mario Three D World, or um, maybe go look at some games that are a little smaller. In scope, yeah. Well, um, you know, there's there's something called opportunity cost, yeah, in the world of finance, which basically means uh, I have a dollar. Am I going to spend the dollar on a chocolate bar, 
or am I going to spend it on four gumballs? And you can't do both. You have to pick. You know, if you do one gumball, you're married to gumballs at that point. Your, your chocolate bar's gone. And so it's kind of that way. I mean, we could t- talk about it financially, but but honestly, time is the same kind of an. A, I mean, it's it's a resource. Mm-hmm. So do we want to spend our money and time on four small games, or do we want to spend it on one big game? Um, yeah, I'm completely with you on that. Mm-hmm. Completely with you. In fact, you know this this is contributing factor to me on um, why I feel like I have abandoned Fallout Four. I was enjoying it. I really was. Um, and, and I can't say that what I'm doing in uh, Mad Max is not samey. It very much is. But I just feel kind of burned out on Fallout 4 because I got to a certain place in the plot where, uh, well, I, I'll just go ahead and talk about it. You know, spoiler-wise, because um, this is a big spoiler, you get to a point where you find the Institute, which is uh, the Commonwealth Institute of Technology, which is a big take on you know massachusetts institute mm-hmm. so it's, it's mit you're in the basement of mit and they've, they've made this big um post fall uh, haven it's a haven and, and and above ground they fear them and they think they're terrible but down once you get down there you realize it's basically this utopia it's also uh tied to finding sean and there's a big fake out because sean's your son mm-hmm. um there's a big fake out with that and and then there's resolution and i i gotta tell you it, i didn't beat the game but I feel like I beat the game. I feel like narratively, it just dropped into the floor. There was complete resolution. And I feel like if I move forward, I'll screw something up. You know how when you get to a, the fifth season of a really good show and you feel like you get closure? Yeah. And then they come out with a sixth season and they introduce a new thing? Mm-hmm. I, I That happens a lot. I, Dexter, for me, it was like, honestly, it was pretty, much, pretty much after season two. I mean, it was yeah. like... Okay, honestly, I'm yeah. done. Um, that's the way it was for <laughs> and me. They just keep going. So I got I got to this point in the institute, and basically, um, the leader of the institute, who they call Father, mm. said, uh, "You need to go meet these people and decide whether or not you want to stay or you want to go." That decision is irrelevant. That's the end of the movie to me. Um, that that choice brings out a whole new thing and a whole. Do I want to go back to Sanctuary where I've spent all this time building up? You know, I've got an economy going there now. Mm. Um, or do I want to stay down here? Or do I want? To, what do I want to do? And the choice is kind of irrelevant. And so I walked away from the game. I literally put it down and, and, and decided, back to what we were talking about before, mm-hmm. uh, there's an opportunity cost I have here. I, I want to try some new games. I want, to, I want to play some other things. And that's when I picked up Mad Max. And I've been enjoying it. So you, so you also have a case of open world fatigue when it comes In that- to Fallout 4. In that example, yeah. yes. And I may hit fall... I love that. Open world fatigue. Yeah. I may hit open world fatigue with Mad Max, but I haven't yet. Right. Well, and part of that, too, is it's a new experience. And mm-hmm. that's part of it, too. So, like, like because it's new, you're, you're going to have that... Everything's going to feel fresh, even though, like you said, it's still repetitive. It might still be playing a game that is open world, but it's not the same. It's different. Yeah. You don't know exactly what to expect. And, of course, from a gameplay perspective, these are two very different games. Now, the... the um, you know, thematically, there might be a lot of similarities. Mm-hmm. The world itself might have a lot of similarities because they're both post-apocalyptic. But Mad Max is more action-oriented, yeah. and it's less of an RPG. And it's more... And they don't have those building elements either. I mean, they do have, I guess you could argue, crafting elements with things like you're telling me with uh, building up your car oh, yeah. and stuff like that. But it's it's set up in a different way, at least from... Uh, what you've been telling me, mm-hmm. that's what it sounds like. It's well, so differently. That's a perfect segue into our meaty topic today. So let's stick a pin in that for just a couple minutes. Yes, and do a couple of more interesting and fun segments. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. I guess it's no big secret that Chris and I play Hearthstone. But one of the big announcements this week is that there's going to be a new way to play Hearthstone. So I'm going to give two mobile minutes here. The first one is going to be a very cynical mobile minute, and then the other one is going to be a less cynical mobile minute. Mobile minutes. So uh, the first one is this. They have officially broken Hearthstone. Um, As with any, let's call it collectible card game, you reach a saturation point, which makes the game pretty unplayable. Um, I have actually complained about this a little Mm -hmm. bit recently, that the... The difficulty of coming in as a new player has got, hit such a steep curve that they have, in my 
um, conspiratorial theories here. Actually, been trying to game the system in such a way uh, so that the algorithm will look and see what you whether or not you have epics in your deck and match you up with people who don't if you don't. That's why if you make your deck out of epics, suddenly you're, you're hitting a whole new class of players, um, and you're going to hit a wall of... Um, let's let's say the the uber nerds who spend all their time playing the game. Whereas if you make a simple deck out of the basic cards, you're actually going to find uh, a much more fun experience. Now you'll never level all the way up. The meta won't let you, but uh, you can at least get to level 15 or 14 using say all murlocs or, or something fun with a themed deck. Okay, so that's my cynical uh, version of it. Now the the less cynical one will be this. They've also fixed or at least are, are going to fix, um, in their opinion, this uh, problem. This is how they've chosen to do it. They have announced there will be two modes. Uh, one's going to be what they're calling a standard mode, and the other's going to be wild mode. So without looking in what those definitions are, you might immediately think they're introducing wild mode. Got it. Yeah. This is incorrect. Actually, what they're going to do is they're going to label the current mode wild mode, <laughs> where you can use any card, anything goes, um, from the beginning all the way through now, you can play. And then this is different from the new mode they're introducing, which is called standard mode. They're going to use the zodiac of the Hearthstone world of Azeroth, right? Mm-hmm. And each year is going to have its own sign. So the first one is Kraken, which I'm excited about. The Bracken Kraken is, is coming here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what it means is that any of the cards that are a ca- within that calendar year introduced, you can use in standard mode. Then when the new... Because there's, there's 12 seasons um, in the sense that they have a new season every month. I don't know if they're continuing that. I assume they are. Um, but within that calendar year, those seasons you can use in standard mode any of the cards that have come out that year, within the last calendar year. And so what it's going to do is it's going to limit in terms of uh, competition, think of it like a, uh, a tournament, like say, I mean, I'm not a magic player, but say you were going to a magic tournament, you would be limited to that run of cards. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same thing. So it's interesting to see how they've solved their own um, glut of cards problem. And I've created a new mode, which is actually going to be more limiting than the current mode and funneling you into if you want to play competition wise, you need to stick to the new cards and it's going to stop some of the problems, the sort of game breaking problems that I've, I've seen. Interesting. So well, it'll be interesting to look back on it um, here in like the coming months and see how successful that is. I agree. Very much agree. Um, and also there's a new 2016 um, expansion that's going to be um, introduced at the same time that they, they roll this out. So mm-hmm. we're not quite sure what that is yet, but uh, maybe by the time this podcast comes out, we will. I cool. Don't know. I'm looking forward to it for one. Um, I think it's going to be great to have a little bit more limited meta. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. Okay, so for this next segment, um, we're going to bring back the nostalgia trip. We haven't talked about it, or haven't give, had one of these segments in a little while. Whoa, trippy. <laughs> and this is going to be a um, actually a special uh, themed version, where uh, essentially we are, we are recording today on Valentine's Day. Oh, I love um, you, man. <laughs> I just want you to know that. I love you too, man. Yeah. Uh, but this is also uh, Singles Awareness Day, is the other, other title for Valentine's Day. Yeah, hey, I'm married. I don't, I don't know <laughs> But I thought it might be fun to look at games, um, just to, and I've picked four games that, to me, these are games that are worth playing on um, Singles Awareness Day, um, or Valentine's Day, too, because they're all pretty good games. But um, these are just kind of games that, that all kind of have this this theme of loneliness and um, being by yourself, and there's no romantic elements to these games at all. <laughs> Not at all. Like, zero romantic elements. <laughs> Um, and, oh, you're my hero. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. So for those that don't want to be exposed to that, these games won't. None of it. Excellent. Um, and so I'm going to go through my list here, and we can just Thank chat you for, a little bit for about for curating it. This, this loneliness experience yes. for us so that we don't accidentally <laughs> encounter a relationship. That would oh, Exactly. Right. That would be horrible, right? That would right? suck, dude. And also, uh, I will, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll tweet these out after we're done and just kind of mention it and just 
so that we can see it in advance on this on the actual singles awareness day so that later they can get a little more context by oh, listening okay. to the podcast. You're time traveling again, aren't yes, you? Yes, time travel. Okay, good stuff. So uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is Metroid Prime. And Oh, yes. yeah, Lonely Girl uh, on her own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in, and in, you're in, in this, space. With, yeah, you're in, in okay. you're in the, you're in space. You're I'm in this you. alien environment, and um, it's there is definitely a sense of of being alone, having to survive on your own, get by by yourself. Um, you sure it, that's not a metaphor for internet dating? Also, could be. Oh, okay, <laughs> um, and really the 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 inter- and when I was thinking of games that fit this list, um, the very first game I thought of was Metroid. I just chose Metroid Prime because I feel you really get that sense of loneliness in it. But I could have really picked any Metroid game. It's a beautiful game. Yeah, and it also looks great. Still, to this day, I think mm-hmm. it's still very beautiful. But I agree. Um, I thought it was interesting. The first game that I thought of was a game that stars a female protagonist. The very first one I thought of, I was like, well, Metroid, yeah. Because sure. that whole game, is the whole series has been about that. Um, the one thing that they do have that runs throughout these games, really starting with Metroid 2, um, is a theme of motherhood. Which is a big part of the game where you've got... Uh, essentially, I'm referring to the relationship between the young baby Metroid... You know, kind of grows up later on. Oh, I thought you were talking about Mother with, Brain. Okay. No, <laughs> the baby Metroid, along with Samus, and like the relationship there. Yeah, her, actually, she essentially is is in Metroid Two. Your gene, your your exterminating a species to mm-hmm. extinction, <laughs> you and are. then you have the one the one Metroid left, and you you instead of killing it, you decide not to help it. Are you my mommy? Uh, yeah, which was a good decision because it saves your life later in Super Metroid. So. Um, uh, but yes, Metroid Prime, that's that's one game that I think is a great one to really sink your teeth into these themes. Um, the next game I want to talk about is Myst. Oh, The and, Island. <laughs> yes, The Island. This is a classic, for those don't, that don't know, this this game sort of kind of redefined what an adventure game could be when it came out. Mm-hmm. Um, they had been much more focused on character interaction and inventory management, whereas with Myst. Uh, you don't really have an inventory you can carry, like, I think one item at a time or something, if I recall. Aside from the pages. You yeah, can, like, you can item. interact with stuff. And then, right. Yeah. But there's no real inventory management, and there aren't any other characters aside from the two brothers in the books. Right. But the world itself, you see this world with, with um, various buildings and, and sometimes art. You know, sometimes there's they're, they're very rich environments that you're mm-hmm. in, and clearly people used to live here, but you don't encounter any people. Yeah, they remastered that not too long ago. I, I was meaning to take a look at it, but I never really did. Yeah, and one of the things they did in the re- in, and I'm not sure there's there's been a couple of versions, and I, I'm not sure if the remastered version has both versions or not. The original game had still images, like mm-hmm. you would you would see the images rendered rendered images, and just looks looked pretty good. And uh, you would transfer to different screens. Then they came out with a version called I want to say 3D Mist, I think, where, where there are transitions. Well, it actually, they, they, the environments, um, you can move around as though you're in three dimensions. Oh, really? Yeah. I missed that one. But it actually doesn't really work, because oh. the game wasn't designed that way. Right. So it doesn't really feel right with the art. I think the remastered version either lets you do it both or returns to the old style with just updated graphics. Uh, but it's also a beautiful game. And I would say, if you're looking at, at themes for this, um, I think hum- human nature, because you get to sort of um, examine or consider... Why aren't why aren't these people here anymore? And you get to read about all of these experiences in um, different books mm-hmm. to hear the relationship of the brothers, and of course also loss because there used to be thriving communities here. There used to be all these people here, and now there's not. Right. So what happened to them? Why aren't they here? Um, the the tourism dried up, and they all left. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that was the parody by Parity uh, Games, and that was called Pissed. Pissed. Yeah. Pissed. Yeah. Sorry. That was actually a fun game. Too. It was it really. Um, so that's my that's my second entry. Um, my third entry uh, is a game called Another World, and this was a game by uh, designed by Eric Chahi. Yeah, I, believe, I remember that one. A French developer, right? Mm-hmm. And it was very interesting when it came out. It was a it was a narrative experience, really, but it was one that didn't have any dialogue, mm-hmm. and it was focused more on you're in this world and you're experiencing things happening, um, and you let the story unfold for yourself. So there's actually different ways you can technically interpret some of the story elements yeah. of the game. Well, it was very platformy, as I recall. And it was, and the controls are really not the best, to be perfectly honest. Well, it's a different age um, and time. It was, and I, but I do think it's a it's a really fun experience. And it, they recently came out, uh, to, as you reminded me, um, with a remastered version. Yeah, they did. Sort of update some of the graphics. Uh, that was like what two years ago, 
It was it was recently. Maybe longer. I don't remember. Yeah, I know it was pretty. I know it was beyond 2010. It was somewhat recently. Um, so that's an interesting game, and and the one relationship that you do have with a character in that game, and there are a few characters, um, is a friendship. So it's it's sort of mm-hmm. instead of a romance, this one has a bromance. A bromance. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so and it, with one of the alien creatures, and you sort of have this bond. You can't really communicate in the traditional sense, mm-hmm. but you have this bond where he's. He's trapped, and, and he's sort of captured, and you help free him, and now you sort of work together to escape from this nice. this world. Um, this is a, another game, like the other two, where you're in this alien environment. You feel kind of um, unsure of yourself and unsure of your surroundings, and it's very much about survival. And in the, thir- then the fourth game I'd like to talk about um, is Doom. <laughs> and, and for me, less, less story-driven than the others, of course. Uh, not really a story-heavy game. But uh, like the others, you're in this, uh, this other environment, this alien world. This time you're just straight-up killing aliens. And that's the deep theme of, of Doom is just fragging. They're, just they're destroying demons, aliens. Aren't they? Hmm? Aren't they alien, like alien demons? They're alien or demons. demons. Demon and, aliens? And, and it gets to a point where it's like, you're, I think if I remember correctly, you're on the moon. You're on like a moon base, and someone opens a portal to hell, yeah. and demons come out, or they possess well, it the people on the there. Depends on the version, because it's like the Martian base at one point. Yeah, and then, the Martian base yeah. and all that, and it's like you know different versions. I know, and then Doom, Doom Two, of course, it's Hell on Earth, right? Exactly. Um, like the title, but yeah, these are the four games that, uh, to me, they all have this theme of you're by yourself, you have to learn how to cope alone. Uh, very much survival based games, and uh, they're also a lot of fun. I picked games that I that I personally believe still hold up to this day uh, for various reasons. And, uh, yeah, that's my nostalgia. Nice. Thing. Well, um, check, out, check out the trailer for the new Doom. Um, oh, I have. <laughs> because I have. some of the animations are amazing. And, and we actually know one of the guys who, uh, who worked on the animations for that game. Mm. So um, I've, I've got a little vested interest there because we went to school together. A guy named Jeff. I am very excited for Doom. Yeah. Very excited. So I, I, I am completely looking forward to this game. Yeah. Um, what, one, one deep philosophical question, though, yes. before we move on. Um, bromance. Does this require going on mandates? <laughs> um, in a manner of speaking, I guess. Okay. It depends on what you what, what classifies as a date. Ah, I understand. Yeah. Is hanging out a date? Sort of? Not really? Well, it's, it's different. It's a mandate. Right, exactly. Which I assume you would be compelled to do. Yeah. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. I recently got the Samsung Gear VR. And this is essentially a cheap. It's a cheaper. It's made by Oculus, but it is a um, powered by Oculus technology. But uh, it was a cheaper version that you can attach your phone to. Like it's kind of a mount, and you stick your phone into it. Now, is it a specific phone, or it works for various Samsung phones? Samsung like, specifically. Okay. Yes, it works for the uh, the Note four and five. Sorry, Siri. And then I'm sorry, the Note four and five, and then the Samsung uh, Galaxy Edge five and six. Okay. So, and I have a Note 5, so it works for me. So you stick your tablet into it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work? No. Um, but, it, but it does have a size adjuster because the Note is a lot bigger than the other phone. So that in order to fit sense. the Note, you have to adjust it a little bit. Um, it actually works pretty well considering it is, it's only $100. Yeah. So you get this, this VR um, headset for only 100 bucks. Wow. Surprisingly, it works pretty well. Free app, I assume? Uh, there's, a, there's oh, to, you, to actually use the 3D yeah, stuff yeah. once you buy it, of course, yes. Yeah. But there's a ton of apps. And there's a ton of oh, things really? you can do in it. Okay. Some of them free, some of them not. Like for example, oh. you can watch Netflix mm-hmm. on it, and it, you you puts you inside like your own like home theater experience kind of thing. Um, you can purchase movies that are actually you know 3D movies mm-hmm. and watch them in various environments depending on what you choose. Or you can see, for example, some of the some of the free stuff is that you they put you as one of the. Um, audience members but you're like right kind of on stage and like the Cirque, the, the Cirque du Soleil stuff like that. It really? Looks, it looks pretty realistic considering this is a $100 $100, um, $100 headset uh, uh, virtual reality and it makes you it's, it's tr- essentially they're trying to kind of wet your whistle for the Oculus right. for PC which is of course a lot more expensive. Um, yeah people were actually complaining because it was like what, 600 bucks or something. It is. A couple, couple hundred bucks more than they originally predicted. I complained about that too. I think that I think that's cost prohibitive. But really, I, I really do. Well, you compare it to other systems, and it's it's not. I mean, is it a peripheral or is it a system? That's the real but question. That's the thing. It is a peripheral. It's yeah. not a system. It is it is a means to play other games that are going to have to be made specifically for that system. Which is well, why. But it's get, it gets shipped with Lucky's Tale, and um, we know. Uh, actually, Professor uh, Phil Johnson, who's yes. been on yes. um, on the podcast before, he, he's one of the guys who worked on Lucky's Tale. So. 
Um, I don't know. I, I, I think we need to get out, out from behind this idea that uh, it's a peripheral. Because we're very quickly moving into an area where a console is not going to be a console anymore. It's going to be the size of my phone. Um, like, you know, the PlayStation 6 probably will be the size of a phone. And, and then you'll be able to play on your phone or hook it up, and it'll be wireless. And you bring it next to a TV, you can play it on a TV. I, you bring it next to a controller, you can, you can play I'm it. I'm not so sure that's going to happen. You don't think that's going to no, happen? I no, I think, think that's totally going to happen. Well, the main reason why I don't believe it's going to happen is because... You heard it here first, guys. Well, the, 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 there's, there's a console gaming experience and a handheld gaming experience and the mobile gaming experience. Yeah. And right now, the mobile gaming experience is 99.9% crap. I mean, that's just the truth. No, you're right. And then you have the console experience. The 1% is fantastic, but, yeah, but the 99% but most of it is, is, crap. Is, is crap, unfortunately, because it's, it, it's rife for shovelware. And when, yes. you have a, when you have a handheld, the big difference is you have buttons. Mm-hmm. Even, though it's a, even though it's still a small screen, you have buttons. And yes, you can buy a controller for your phone, mm-hmm. and you can buy a little mount with buttons. But because it doesn't come standard, they don't. the developers don't feel the obligation to... Make those make it work for, with buttons. So therefore, you have these sort of wonky controls most of the time. Well, not yet, but that's my point. Is that well, it's not compatible? But that's my point. I don't think I don't think it's going. There's going to be a big enough push to move in that direction. And especially when you're talking about console games, where you actually have a controller in your hand, and it's all about trying to trying to have to see it on a large screen. I don't think that's going to go away. I still think it's going to happen. I think you'll have a controller in your hand. You'll see it on a big screen. It's just the thing that's controlling the processing, if you will, mm-hmm. is about the size of your phone, and you can take it with you. Well, I suppose in that sense, it's a more m- mobile version of it. I can kind of see that. I know the Wii U sort of did some, tried to do something a little similar where you have like the tablet that's a good example. set up, and you can actually pick it up move it to a different room. I don't I, know how I comfortable think the Wii U is moving all over the place. but It's is misplaced in a number of ways. I, I don't really enjoy the Wii U experience. Um, but actually, that, that reminds me of a question I was going to ask you about. Uh, what, what's it called again? The Not the, the, the Oculus. The Gear VR? Yeah, Gear I'm, I'm, getting, VR. I'm getting a little bit off topic. Okay. But go um, ahead. Well, how heavy is it? Um, I mean, it's, it's not heavy. Is it balanced? Does it, does it sit on your face right? Do, do you feel like it's going to fall off? No, it has. You, you set up all these um, straps on it, and so that it, it can go around your ears and then over your head. Oh, man, it's like middle school again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it. there are times when I feel like I have to balance it. And if it moves a little bit on your eye, um, of course, there's problems with fogging up. There's mm-hmm. also problems with if it moves a bit, you have to readjust the focus. You can technically wear glasses and then put it on, but I found that it fogs up too quickly. So I typically don't wear my glasses with it and then adjust the focus because my eyesight's not that bad. Yeah, I can adjust the focus and I can get it pretty pretty good so that I can play for a while or, mm-hmm. or watch something for a while. I've played with the Oculus. Um, I actually have to do it without my glasses. Yeah. And the last time I used the Oculus, uh, the, the experience that I had was not... Good, but I'll but I'll admit it's been a little while since I've used it. Yeah, and I know they've been improving it. So well, about forty percent of the people have um, motion sickness when they use. Yes, those and things. I did too. Yeah, I had so. an experience where I looked. They said don't do this, but I did. I looked down to try to see where my hands were because I had to. You were supposed to be using keys to move around. And sure, yeah. I didn't know where I was. I looked down. I saw my hands through the like opening on the bottom of uh-huh. the, the headset, and then I then I did this and looked right back up really quickly and. Closed it, and now I'm back in the 3D space, and I have to take the headset off. I almost threw up. Oh, I mean, wow. it was really yeah. bad. So there are, there are some issues with that, and some of, the, some of the things, the experiences can be really fast, like a, a skydiving thing, for example, and it was really quick, and you move around a lot. Mm-hmm. So there, there's, potentially an issue, there's potentially an issue of motion sickness there. I've been okay with the Gear VR so far. But the one thing I wanted to talk about was there was this, um, is essentially a short film, and it won the Oculus Mobile VR Jam, apparently. And it's called, uh, okay. I don't know how to pronounce this, but either, I think it's Coloss or Colossae. Um, it's essentially because there is a Colossus within the game. Uh-huh. But uh, it's, it's, it's spelled C-O-L-O-S-S-E. So Coloss, I guess. Okay. Um, but Col- it, Colossae. Yeah, Colossae, yes. Colossae. It's, a, it's a short, a very short game. I'm sorry, a very short um, film experience, I guess you could say. And... I was reading a bit about what he wanted to do with it, and what it turned out, it didn't really seem like it did that. It was supposed to be, depending on where you, where you focus your gaze, the events in the story would play out a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And maybe that happens, but it's 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 very slight. Um, essentially what happens is it's in this very this simplistic uh, po- polygons as the way the world is built out yeah, in yeah. this sort of Arctic environment. Um, but it works. With the color themes work, it's very... Um, 
It's stylistic. I would say I like the art. It's stylistic. It's very simplistic, but it's stylistic. Um, and it's, it's it does look pretty beautiful. And the idea here is that you are this sort of like hunter in this Arctic environment, and there's this large creature, like a colossus, mm-hmm. that sort of chases you. Um, the interesting part here is that because it's 360, you're supposed to kind of sit in a, sh- a swivel chair, so you can kind of swivel around and see all around you without having to turn your head all the way back. Oh, okay. Um, but depending on where you look, and as you look around, the story kind of unfolds in front of you. It's very short. It's maybe a five-minute experience. I've, I've ran through it a couple of times, and it, I had a very similar experience both times. Um, what I, I think is interesting is I had, I had read before I, I watched this about the exciting possibility of these sorts of VR films, like having a film experience where it's designed to be from the start to be viewed in 360 degrees and to see, you know, everything around you. And they designed the story to play out that way. Mm-hmm. So it's very different from looking at a flat screen. My problem with that is that a big part of what makes a film work is that you have a director yeah. that is deciding, okay, I want to focus on this part because this is important to the story that I'm trying to tell, or this is important to get across a certain message or theme. I was worried people. about that. Yeah. And that's kind of what happens here. If you're not looking in a certain a certain area, you either miss what's going on or... Because there's, there's little things. Like, for example, if there's a little crab at the beginning that's, that's walking near one of the little ice flows. And if you focus on the crab, the crab will kind of move a little bit and move around and kind of do a little bit extra than he mm-hmm. did before. But that really has nothing to do with the story that's going on. Right. And when you start to be chased by that, or the little hunter starts to be chased by the colossus, or, you know, when he's hiding inside this little cave from the Colossus, and the Colossus is, you know, trying to to look for him. He hides behind a rock and all that. That stuff plays out whether you're focused on the right area or not. So you can sort of lose sight of essentially what's happening around you. You can lose sight of it um, because you have all this freedom. So I I thought it was an interesting experience that I actually would recommend to someone that has the uh, Gear VR headset. Yeah. But I also, I don't, I think it's, we need to be a little careful about trying to move film in that direction mm-hmm. uh, because I really do think that you're losing something if you're going to let a viewer decide where they're looking. That works for, if, for example, if you're in a, um, if you're in an environment like you're at a show, um, like say a Cirque du Soleil and there's things happening all around you and you can choose what to focus on. Right. Or you're like in a VR experience where you're like in like a sports stadium and you could decide what part of the field you want to look at. Uh-huh. And always there's things happening. Well, sure, that works. But if we're talking about a film where there's supposed to be a narrative, there's supposed to be a story, there's supposed to be um, themes and messages that the director wants to at least make you think about, if not, you know, impart those to you, mm-hmm. he has to have some control about over where you're looking. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, even for like for 20 years or so in cutscenes, uh, think about like Half Life, for yeah. example. Some of the cutscenes will happen naturally as you can still walk around and do that kind of a thing. You know, you can turn your head and look away and, and that sort of a thing. You may be locked in the room or, or whatever. But if you're not looking directly at the speakers, you're going to miss that so-called cutscene. And mm-hmm. it's a choice, um, but it it may not translate well over into some of this new VR technology. That's interesting. Yeah. A really good point. And next time I will report back with my experiences playing Quake on the Gear VR. Oh, dear. I looked. I was trying to find Doom. Mm-hmm. I didn't find it, but apparently someone has translated all of Quake. Sweet. Into, into full 360, full, you know, full uh, VR. Apparently it works really well. The only thing that holds me back from playing it is I have to go out and buy a gamepad. Because you can't use the little... There's a little touchpad sure, controls, yeah. I should have mentioned this, that are up on uh, the right side of your head, mm-hmm. like near your um, temple. And you, there's a little um, sort of like a, a directional pad there and volume controls and a back button. Awkward. Yeah, so it kind of works. And, you, and, and it definitely works for if you're trying to navigate through the menus. However, for something like playing Quake, you really do need buttons. Bluetooth? Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to go see about which one. I'm not, I still haven't decided which controller I'm going to get, but yeah, they, it supports a variety of Bluetooth controllers. One step closer <laughs> to my prediction. <laughs> no, no, and I think, I, I actually do think there's definitely plenty of games that will work in this space. My only thing is I think that there's going to be, it's going to be its own thing. It's going to be its own experience. Yeah. And, and for people that want that experience, you're going to have the option for it. But there's also going to be that, that experience of, the home console experience and there's going to and i think that's going to be melding more and more into pc but not necessarily the mobile space sure we might see some blurring of lines there with handhelds and mobile as we move more towards buttons but a big a big proponent a big component of that is you have to have things standard you have to have buttons standard that's, if they're not standard it limits you point. on what the developers can do that's a very good point
This Week in Gaming History. A couple of weeks ago, January 28th to be precise, uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, it's the birthday of Final Fantasy Tactics North American release. Hey, wow. Um, this is a game that came out on PlayStation back in 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a, it is, or it is a uh, strategy or tactical role-playing game, you know, you ask. V- similar in vain to the Fire Emblem series, but those games really hadn't come out in the West yet. Mm-hmm. So this was one of the first real experiences that we had over here in that genre. Um, along with, uh, you know, there's a few others that had come out before, but this was the, this was, had a big name attached to it. Everybody knew Final Fantasy. Yeah, this one was kind of seminal. It was, and people really didn't know what, what they were getting into because you hear Final Fantasy and you think of, well, you've got this um, simplistic, you know, good versus evil story, basic role-playing mechanics, turn-based combat, um, and you think you kind of know what you're getting into, and when you play Final Fantasy Tactics, it's very different. You're in a world that's more morally gray. The characters have, they all, all the characters have their own motivations. They're not necessarily, you can't really fit them so easily into the box of, well, this is the good guy, um, Cloud, and he has this wild hair, and he's going to go, he's going to go beat the bad guy, Sifrith, and, you, and he's he's all evil, and he's going to, you know, he's going to kill your girlfriend. Right. You don't have that kind of, I mean, there's definitely characters that are bad, and there's like demonic influence and monsters and stuff within it too, but the the real conflicts in the game are human conflicts and conflicts between warring, warring nations. So it becomes a lot more humanized and it feels historical. It feels like you're in a world that is inspired by medieval history. And even though you have magic in this world and you have creatures like uh, the like uh, Chocobo creatures, like, you know, little um, yellow birds that they ride around. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, so you have those Everybody things. Everybody knows what a Chocobo is. Right. Well, f- for those that may not... Um, it's a very it's a it's a different sort of game, and I and I think it's it's really one of the best of this style of game of a tactical RPG because the story is so rich. It's one of the um, more rich and complex game uh, game stories from Japan. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that a little bit. That it's, 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 it's a good game, and if you haven't played it, they they re released that thing all the time. There was a version that came out on P- PSP. I believe you can get it on PlayStation Network. I mean, it's it's all over the place now, so it's yeah. worth going back and revisiting if you have some time. It's a long game, and there's a lot. There's a lot of effort you have to put into it to get through it, but it's worth it. You know those marshmallow peeps that they sell around this time of year? Yeah, those are those are baby chocobos. Baby chocobo. Yeah, that's what <laughs> chocobo chicks. Yeah. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. Okay, so for our meaty topic today, wow, we, we've really been talking about it this this whole time, honestly. Um, it's kind of this idea of, are games too big for themselves now? Hmm. You know, we have these massive teams, 400, 500 people making a game, uh, and then that's almost contrasted with the indie scene of these tiny little game experiences. Um, I know for me personally... If I make the choice between binging on this 100-hour game or snacking on a bunch of small games, if cost is not a factor, I tend to kind of go towards those small games. Hmm. Um, Now, I've fallen away from Steam games recently, just out of personal preference. I spend a lot of time in front of the computer, and I think... Like you, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be on the yeah. couch. <laughs> we we talked about that we did, last yeah. time where, where we moved, moved a little bit away from the from the gaming chair and moved mm-hmm. to the moved to the couch and the right. recliners and all that. So, you know, console is where it's at for me. But you know what? With um for example, um PlayStation Network, man, you can download just about anything nowadays and, and they're making ports for all this stuff. It's becoming pretty universal. Um honestly it's the big games that are the pri- proprietary ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, le- you know, less and less the little ones because those markets, they're trying to diversify. And so you can find it on the Xbox downloads and you can find it on the PlayStation downloads and you can find it, you know, Nintendo's still kind of doing its own thing. But um, for the most part, if you want to play, say, The Witness, which you reminded me of when you were talking about Myst, um, we can do that. Just, you know, go grab it, go download it. It's it's a cheap little game. It's going to be a couple of, a couple of nights and, and you're pretty done with it. It's all about mazes. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Are you are you a binge gamer or are you a snacker? Um, I think I mean I know I've always when I've been, my gaming experiences have always kind of been a mixture of both. 
And well, I, that's a fair thing to say. Yeah, yeah and I sure. think I think more so um, when I was around, you know, high school and college, I was much more into these long gaming experiences and playing through, you know, RPGs that might take at the minimum, you know, sixty out. 40, 50, 60 hours to yeah, beat. Yeah, that was a big game um, back then. Yeah, that was a big... And still, I mean, for example, with Witcher 3, you can probably beat that game if you do more mainline quests and something more like 40, 50, 60 hours. Mm-hmm. It's just mo- there's a lot of people that put in 100 plus. Same thing with games like, you know, the Fallout games, um, from the more recent ones like 3 and New Vegas and 4, or like Skyrim, Oblivion. Right. Those games, they're going to take you... You can beat them in like, you know, 40 to 60 hours, but... A lot of people are putting in a hundred plus hours yeah. of those games, yeah. and I found that you know now you that I play I've forever been, and never beat it. I mean, right? That's... And now that I've been working, um, you know, full time, I feel that I don't have the the drive as much of a drive to play those games. Even though I think I think it's a little incorrect to say that maybe games are getting too big. I think it's more that we may be um, maybe I don't, I don't want to say that we've outgrown that experience because I don't think it's a anything to do with the maturity level. I just think that it's we're in a different stage in our lives mm-hmm. and therefore uh, we are looking for a different smaller experiences for the most part. Yeah. Um, we can still enjoy those games and I have, and you've enjoyed fallout four. You're enjoying Mad Max yeah. now, but I want to experience more of those smaller games, um, games that you can get in, you can play, you can even have an experience in like 15 minutes or 30 minutes or maybe even less and then kind of move on. This is something that I t- I've talked about before. Um, and some of the, when we were, used to write articles on our old site about the arcade game experience and games that, that take oh, after yeah. arcades and um, playing through games that are um, smaller and you can you can play them for a little while and you have to learn how to get through. But even when you are when you actually know how to play the game, you're really good to get through it in one run. For example, a game like um, Gradius, you could beat the full game in like 30 to 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I might, be, I might be an overestimate, to be honest. It's been a while since I played through it. But it's a game that, you know, if you're good, you can get through it and you feel like you have a complete experience and you really, technically, when you look at some of the our experiences here, the games that we play, um, it's it just takes so much less of a time commitment. Oh, you know what? You just brought up a really good point. I'm not even sure you meant to. <laughs> um, and, and it's that the older games, you know, we're talking cartridge games here, stuff with no memory in it, yeah. right? You, you plug the thing in, you turn it on, you start from the beginning and you play until you die. And then you either start over again or you put it away or you put another cartridge in, right? And there's a literacy that comes with that, a, a player skill level that comes with that. I remember Contra is oh, yeah. one of those Great uh, classic of those. ones. Yeah. You have to know what you're doing with Contra. You have to know the controls. You have to be really good at it. It's not something you're going to beat the first time no. you play it. But Ever. you can learn. You don't, nec- you don't even need with a game like Contra or Gradius, Life Force, all these kind of games. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to sit there and have someone get, give you a tutorial. You can learn as you go. It's just you're going to die yeah. as you learn. Well, yeah, and, and I think that's that's a big difference between maybe the... this. I'm, I'm entering into thesis territory here. Um, the, the idea between a gamer then, in other words, us, and a gamer now, which would be us now, mm-hmm. uh, as well as younger gamers, and that's we expect, even though we may have learned something new mm-hmm. um, to be in a different area, to have a different sequence, to have the roguelike experience where it's new and different. The elements have been recombined for us. Because we don't want to play level one 60, 70, 80, 100 times. And in something like Contra or Mario or Gradius, that first level, you have it memorized right? through repetition. Uh, I can't stomach that stuff anymore. Although I, I used to, I used to be able to, and I would think with like something like the Mario games, I think are an example of, unlike these games like Contra, Life Force, Gradius, you know, all these old games where you had to die a lot on each level, so you you learned the levels extremely well because of death. Right. Whereas with Mario, it's actually it's an easier game, so you're expected to until you start to get to some of the later levels, much later. Um, but even then, as it has a much more forgiving learning curve. Well, it certainly so, wasn't easy whenever it was the very first game platformer I'd ever picked up. Right, but they had designed that first level in such a way that maybe not your first try, maybe, but maybe you're more like maybe your second try, you should be beating that first level. Because it's set up in a way that you're learning how to do the very, very basics of Mario. If you're talking about cool. someone who's never picked up a controller before... I am. and Because I, I was that kid. That was my uh, first you were, game, you were my gaming first experience. <laughs> and I sat down, and that, that, that level is... I mean, it is, 
especially once you learn you learn the basics of the control basic controls of Mario, yeah. you can start clearing through several levels. And I whereas I like Contra, my... you have to know you have to know more than just the controls. Okay, well I'll give you that. That's what I'm saying. With there's Contra, a strategy involved. Gradius, too. Life Force. These are games where you have to know more than just the controls, you have to know the stage. Yeah. Whereas with Mario, you never felt like... You felt like as long as you knew what to do, like control-wise, mm-hmm. you could win. I had a sleepover birthday party on my 13th birthday. Uh, and a bunch of guys from my school came over. And, man, it was the coolest party ever because I was the one who had the Nintendo. And we played all night long. And if we made it to, like, level three or four, I would be shocked. But what I do remember is... That every one of us just sucked at it. We were just terrible. We were just awful. And this was like 1988 or something. Um, so I think there is a there's a, a fundamental literacy that goes into it. Then there's a specific game literacy that comes into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a specific um, personal player literacy that that is involved as well. Um, and I and I could easily pick on my dad at this point, um, who is a uh, a master Assassin's Creed player, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time, um, some other games, you know, he, he, he looks like uh, he's got brain damage. Um, and I think that has to do with personal literacy. I, I also All that ties in uh, to exactly what, you, what you're mm-hmm. saying, though. Um, and, and I'm wondering, is this the reason we're not designing games like this anymore? So that once you've done a part of the game, you're not expected to do that part again. No, and I think yeah, and I and I see what you're saying in that for that point, and I do think um, to use an example like a Mario, what I what I think Nintendo has done successfully in like a lot the newer Mario games that have for a while since something like Mario sixty four, um, even some of the earlier ones like Mario three less so, but they're really good at designing different levels that feel like you're giving you different challenges and different approaches and different things to do. Right. So, like you're saying, it's a little bit less. If you look back at Mario 1, and a lot of this was because of the limitations of, of the hardware. Mm-hmm. And because this was such a, you know, this game was developed only a couple years after the console was made, um, the Japanese version. Mm-hmm. So, there were, they still hadn't known, all, they didn't understand all that they could do, and this was like a template for platformers, really, in a big way. Yeah. So, but later on, they, they, they've kind of perfected that, and they're able to give you all of these different experiences within the same control set. So you don't feel like, um, like you do in Mario 1, so many of the levels feel like a slight variation on similar themes. And they mm-hmm. have a few different themes that you that you can pick from, but aside from those different themes, you kind of are doing similar things each time. It just might be a little more or less difficult. Whereas if you play, I don't know if you've played Super Mario 3D World. Um, but no, I haven't played that one. For the Wii U, which I, I talked about it before on here. Yeah, yeah. The different levels that you that you go through. Different, first, first of all, there's like the thematic worlds, but then each level itself, they have these. Each one feels like it's got this slight, this different um, style to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, part of that is also because you have the, all different designers that are designing, designing the levels. So mm-hmm. you'll have levels that you feel, whoa, this is. I love the way this level was set up, and I love how it progresses. And then other ones, you you get through them, and you're just like, wow, that was kind of. It was kind of a slog. I didn't really <laughs> like doing that because you have different people developing them. And so that also kind of gives different personality to different levels. But like you said, you avoid that trap of it feeling like you're doing the same thing over yeah. and over again. Um, a game like something like those run and gun games or the shoot 'em up games that mm-hmm. we were talking about before, like Contra and Gradius, those games are, those are built on having, you need to know, you need to know the controls, but you got to learn the levels. You got to learn enemy patterns. You have to know exactly how it goes and you're going to die a thousand times until you do. Yeah. And that's and that's a big part of those games, and we don't see those gaming experiences as much anymore, except for when people are intentionally making the game for that reason. Right. You could even argue, and this is kind of interesting because I I love those old games when I was playing them back in the day, but the games that I have struggled with playing now are things like Dark Souls, because me too. It really does have a trial and error element to it. You're supposed to take it a little slow, learn learn from what happens in the environment, and. Uh, you might die a lot of times before you figure out what you're supposed to do and how to get through that level. And a lot of the areas are somewhat similar in the sense that you have to kind of go through similar patterns, but you have to learn the stage. You have to learn where the tra- the traps are. You have to learn where the enemy's going to jump out at you. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like a 3D interpretation of some of those games like Contra Gradius. I agree. And yet, while I love those games, and I can still go back and play those games and have a great time, but that's because I remember all the stuff in those games. Yeah. I probably wouldn't have the patience for those nowadays, and, and and I don't have the patience for something like Dark Souls. And that's a point that I that I wanted to make, too, is something that, that maybe where 
we don't have because perhaps because we're older and don't have as much time for gaming, but it's that, that patience, the patience to sit and to really learn, um, to from take failure. the time and learn from failure yeah. and not feel frustrated where you feel, cause I feel like maybe it's, again, this might be because I've gotten older too. I feel like I want to be also accomplishing something as I play. Right. And for something like a game, like those older games and something like Dark Souls, for the first several several hours that you're playing, perhaps, you're not accomplishing anything aside mm-hmm. from just dying. You're just dying. I mean, you're, you're just you're, learning. Yeah, yeah, you're learning, but you haven't accomplished anything yet because you can't, because you've got to learn a lot before you can really get anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then even when you start getting somewhere, you're not going to get that far. You might, oh, wow, I beat the first stage, barely. Well, too bad, because you don't have enough lives to get any further. Yeah. Because you, you've, you've wasted it all. Or in like Dark Souls, you know, you, you get past a certain point, but then you just get destroyed or clobbered by some other monster. Mm-hmm. So I think patience is another thing that we're sort of, uh, I, in some elements, in some aspects of my life, I have a lot more patience than I did as a kid. Mm-hmm. But for this, for video gaming, I have far less. I, I would agree with that. And I think we also have less tolerance for um, some, of the, some of the meta. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this again. I have 12 lives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that was the old way. Now it's, there better be a narrative reason why when I die, I come back or else it just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, that's actually... Um, one of the things I think is kind of funny about the the Mad Max is that it doesn't quite give you a narrative reason for your respawn, but everything you've accomplished up to it, like literally up to the moment of death, stays. Whoever you've killed, whatever you've done, whatever you've mm-hmm. accomplished, is still done and set. You go back into that same fortress that you were halfway through before, all those guys you killed, they're there. Now, you've you've respawned in a different place, usually, because mm-hmm. there's checkpoints and that sort of thing. But um, it's it, you That's can interesting. just cruise right up to where you were before. It almost makes it feel real time, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it, like, like in MMOs where yeah. you get a certain distance, you've killed certain things, you die. But there's no respawn in that regard, you know. Right. There's sort of an infinite supply of... of, of Bad guys in cars. <laughs> but once you clear out an area, I didn't actually talk about this earlier, but mm. once you clear out an area and, and make it safe, the patrols stop. Mm. Um, and, and people's comments change. And the world f- just feels safer overall. It's fascinating. And hmm. yeah, they've done a really good job of that. But um, anyway, that, that whole, all ties into one really important thing, which I think is too big of a topic for today, but I want to mention it, put a pin in it, and genuinely talk about this soon. Mm-hmm. And it's the difference between player ability and character ability. Mm-hmm. Oh, so, yes. I think this, this is, is a, a fundamental topic. game design principle. Because whenever you talk about um, games like Doom, right? Uh, when, when I load up Doom, and when you load up Doom, there are no RPG elements in Doom. Nope. Um, you can maybe have some more bullets in a different gun because you found it. But other than that, your Twitch value on your ability to, to really zoom, 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 bang, 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 and, and kill that bad guy is going to be all on you on player ability. Uh, I can do that exact same level with the exact same loadout and fail because I have a, a, an inferior player ability. Yet you compare that to something like um, the recent Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront, which I mm. talked about a couple of weeks ago. And what you've got is the same element where I've tweaked up my character so much or twinked up if you prefer that it doesn't matter what I do. If I hit you, you're going to die. And okay. I could stand there and just take the shotgun blasts from you. And I won't die. Because I've got superior equipment. In other words, it comes down to uh, character ability. And that's the difference, sort of the, the wow mentality of some random bozo comes along and is like challenging me to a duel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reject, I reject all duels. I don't, I don't play anymore. But in an yeah. MMO environment, I reject all duels. Because... I hate them. I don't care. I, I don't want you to show off that you found this cool thing and you've got this magical sword of, of killing random people. I don't care. Your character's ability to do that and your ability to click an icon has no interest to me. None whatsoever. It's a completely different gaming experience. But what me. about their ability to run around in a circle around you? Oh, even better. Yeah. <laughs> I just hated that. <laughs> because this is how people used to duel. We'll just like run around in a circle and occasionally click a button. Yeah. Skill. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, I, I do want to put a big pin in that because I think that's a, an important enough topic to come back to, and we can talk about the games that do it right and do it wrong, and and that sometimes the sort of like uh, you know cognitive dissonance that can happen in those ex- those examples. Well, where exactly. In cutscenes, you've got the the character that seems to be very competent, or the opposite, very incompetent mm-hmm. in what they do, and then 
your ability versus that. Yes. Where you're expected to either be up to their confidence level, but you're not yet, or mm-hmm. the reverse, you're expected to be inco- somewhat incompetent or hesitant about what you do, and instead, you're not because you are you don't have the same personality. Yeah, you already as, leveled as up character. your character enough yeah. or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a great topic that we can talk about. Um, and it ties into this because... It, it does. You know, it, it if you're going to make that binge experience where you uh, spend a long time playing, you can build up that character. But if you're going to do something that's more of a snack game, those RPG elements really have no place unless it's uh, more like a great old game called The Dig or something like yeah. that, which was very story-based, very narrative-based. Um, well, it, and you it's say the these difference are... between short story and, yeah. and novel. Well, I was going to say, you say these, these, these RPG elements that go into that too with some of these shorter games, but they had those to an extent, if you think about it, like games like Contra or Gradius. You have these power-ups well, that you get. Power ups, and yeah. one of the things that would that would, could screw you in these games is that you would get, you'd work, for example, and I say Life Force, one of my favorite games of this type. Oh, yeah. Good. And you would, I, you'd get all these power-ups, you'd have like, you'd have, you know, three options, little like floating things that would shoot whenever you did. Mm-hmm. You'd have three options, you'd have force field, you'd have speed up to max, you'd have you know, Ripple or Laser, whichever one you, you'd prefer, and you'd be super decked out. But if you take a couple of hits, you lose your force field, and then you die, you come back. You don't have any of that anymore. So now you're, you've, you you get used to fighting it within a certain level. Suddenly that level becomes significantly harder when you lose those power-ups. That's right. So there is a little bit of a level of, of, of you know, advancement there, but it's not the same... The games had a much more transient sense of it. It punishes you, you it. for failure, right? And it's, and it's and it's not something where oh, um, my character is now leveled up and now I don't have to worry anymore. You get all these advantages, but you, they go away really fast. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Any final thoughts on the the, the short versus long? Well, short I mean, versus long, yeah. Not really. I think I think a lot of it, as we were saying, I mean, it really goes into time. How much time do you have to commit? And where are you, what stage of life are you in? And that's going to influence the sort of games that you're going to play. Are you going to have the time to play? Um, and I guess as the final thought is, um, I'm going to be throughout this year, I think it'll be interesting with all these games coming out that I want to play, trying to figure out, okay, which ones will I actually be able to play and how much time will I be able to, to put into them? Yeah, so true. Some of the games I want to play are huge. Like Persona 5 was an RPG. Yeah. Or Far Cry Primal an open world game or Final Fantasy I'm sorry not Final Fantasy Fire Emblem Fates mm-hmm. which is um, you know tactical RPG so that Horizon how much Dawn time, game that's supposed Horizon to be Horizon Zero Dawn game. I yeah. mean how much time is that an open world game so how yeah. much time are you going to have for that and which ones will be able to you know grip me long enough that I can put enough hours into it like I did with Witcher yeah um, or to a lesser extent because it's not as open worldy but it definitely has open world elements to it Metal Gear Solid 5 mm-hmm. And which ones will I just play for a little while and go? It's not really for me. Due to open world open fatigue. World fatigue. Yeah. There we go. Word of the day. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, guys. We appreciate it. All right, I'm Jim. I'm Adam. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm Doc. Well, you're both. I'm both. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible. Chris, edit that so it doesn't sound so stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chris, make us not sound stupid. Good luck. He doesn't have that much time. <laughs> How do I stop this?